So, we continue in section 2.2. But I need to turn the screen on. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so section 2.2 uh, which is called basic differentiation rules <clears throat> and rates of change. So basic differentiation rules and rates of change. Okay, so the purpose of this section is so that we don't have to keep going through that procedure that we did last time to compute the derivative of any function, right? Computing the derivative of x squared plus 1 took a full page. And that's, you know, we don't want to be doing that. You know, so next week on the quiz, you're going to compute the derivative of many functions. Four, five, six functions. Okay, you're not going to have enough time to compute it the way that we did last time. Okay, <coughs> so then, so then here's the first remark. And this is about the derivative of constants. Okay, so now, let's suppose that we have some function f of x is c. And let's consider its graph. Okay, now just for the purposes of illustration and argument, let's assume that c is some positive value. So then where would c, what would the graph of f of x is c look like? A line, but specifically I thought I heard it. Horizontal. It would be a horizontal line. So then maybe something like this. So it would be like this. Y is C. Okay, so then now, what we want, and what we remember is that the derivative of a function is the slope of a tangent line. Okay, the slope of a graph. So what is the slope of this, of this line here? It's zero. Right? The slope of this line is zero. So what do you expect the derivative to be? Zero, right? And that is in fact the case. That is to say that the derivative, okay, computing the derivative, I'll write it like this first. F prime of x is zero when f of x is constant. Because you should be thinking of this like slope. Now, just as an intermediate remark, an intermediate remark for notation, that is, it is very frequent to denote the derivative of f of, of f of x like this, with this notation. That is to say, f prime of x is d dx of f of x. Okay, so then I can say, if that's the case, I can say, please evaluate this expression for me. d dx 7. What is that? 0. Why? Okay, good. How about what is d dx pi? Zero. Why zero? Because pi is a constant, right? It doesn't matter that we write it as a letter. It doesn't matter. It's a constant, right? It doesn't matter if you're in, in this part of Texas or another part of Texas or if you're on Mars or wherever you are. Pi is pi everywhere you are. Okay, so then <coughs> the derivative of any constant is zero. Okay, so any question concerning that? Okay, now let's see a brief demonstration of why that must be the case. So the reason why that's the case is the derivative of f of x is, by definition, the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x 
over H, like so. Okay, now then this is the limit as H goes to zero of, now, I'll do a little bit of this, so then I'll rewrite the denominator. The denominator is just zero, or is just H, I mean to say, and then minus F of X, we said that was C. Right, so this is with the taking that f of x is some constant c. So what's f of x plus h? Also c, right? <laughs> so what is f of anything at all? C, c everywhere. So then how about the numerator? Can you simplify that? <laughs> yes, the numerator can be simplified to 0 over h. Okay, now, can you, can you plug in the limit point? No, you can't plug in the limit point because you would have 0 divided by 0, but... Everywhere except the limit point, 0 over h is exactly the same as 0, so then now you're computing the limit of 0 as h goes to 0. So what is 0 equal to as h goes to 0? 0, right? That's one of the most fantastic things about 0. It's always 0 no matter what h is doing, or no matter what anything else is doing for that matter. Okay, so any question about this? Any question about this? So the derivative of a constant is 0. Great. Now, we have another rule. Okay, so then this remark is going to be called the power rule. Okay, so then now, I'm going, to I'm going to state several examples that are facts, and from these facts, I want you to try and determine what the general power rule is. So, these things I'm about to write, they are facts, but you don't necessarily know them yet. Okay. So, for example, example one is that the derivative of x squared is 2x. If you were to very carefully use the definition of derivative, you would arrive at this point. Okay, another example, another example is that the derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. And another example is that the derivative of x to the 4 is 4x cubed. Okay, so then now, you tell me what should the derivative of x to the 5 be? 5x to the 4, good. And then how about generally, what is the derivative of x to the n. Right, so it's like uh, you take the exponent, you move it to the front as a multiplier, n multiplied by x to the n minus 1. So this last formula is called the power rule. Okay, this is the power rule. Okay, so then now we need to see why this is the case. <coughs> we need to see why this is the case. Okay, so then the reason why this is the case is as follows. So first, I want you to note the following. That is this. x plus h to the n is an expression that we will have to, com have to evaluate in just a moment. Now, x plus h is called a binomial, okay, because it has two things in it. Bi meaning two, no meaning name. It has two names in it, x and h. Okay, so then I want to raise it to some integer power n. Okay, and the way that you raise a binomial to an integer power n is called the binomial theorem, and the high school, <laughs> secondary school teachers allege they went over this. Okay, so then I have to believe them. At any rate, the formula, the formula for this is as follows. You will get an x to the n, and you will also get n multiplied by x to the n minus 1, and then that multiplied by h. And you will also get n multiplied by n minus 1, multiplied by x to the n minus 2, and then multiplied by h squared. Oh, is that right? That's kind of hard to remember. X to the n, oh, then multiplied by what? 
x to the n minus oh I said n minus two and then wrote n minus one okay <laughs> that's better n minus two h squared and then this is all over two and then plus a lot of terms that don't matter and then finally plus mm, what h squared uh, h to the n Okay, so this is the binomial theorem. So the coefficients here, what you need to see is that the powers of x and h add up to n, right? So then there's no h, so the power of h in this expression is 0. So n plus 0 is n. Here, you have n minus 1 is the power of x, and 1 is the power of h. So n minus 1 plus 1 is n. And then you take this one, x to the n minus 2, that's power n minus 2. h to the 2, that's 2. n minus 2 plus 2 is n. So all the powers of these things is have n, and the coefficients here, like n times n minus 1 over 2, that is a consequence of the binomial theorem. So I hope this is something you remember. Okay, at any rate, even if you don't remember, we can still proceed as follows. The derivative of x to the n is, by definition, the limit as h goes to 0 of x plus h to the n minus x to the n all over h. Okay, so you can see I'm going to need that binomial expansion. So then this is the limit as h goes to 0 of something. Now, let's consider. I have x plus h blah 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 all up here, and then I'm going to subtract from it x to the n. So if I take this this line right here that I'm indicating with my moving dot there, <laughs> and I subtract x to the n from it, what will the result be? Everything but the first term. Right? So it's like I get everything but the first term. So let's see, can I do it? Let's do it. Oh no, not that. I want this one. So everything but the first term. <coughs> so I get that. Isn't that neat? That's great. Okay, and then all over all of that divided by h. Okay, now. <coughs> I can't plug in the limit point. I can't plug in the limit point right now because if I did, the denominator would be 0, so that would be a problem in and of itself. But what would the numera numerator evaluate to? Also 0, because what, what is a common factor in every term in the numerator? h. h is a common factor in every term. It's in there. Okay, so then that means I can cancel, I can factor an h out of the numerator and then cancel it with the h that is in the denominator and obtain something that looks like this. So this is the limit as h goes to 0 of n multiplied by x to the n minus 1. So I canceled that h, that h went away. And then plus n multiplied by n minus 1 over 2 multiplied by x to the n minus 1 plus h, uh, multiplied by h, that is to say, and then plus a bunch of terms that don't matter, plus h to the n minus 1. Okay, so then this is the expression after I, I factor an h out and cancel it. So then now consider all of these terms. What does this one become if I plug in h is 0, this first term? It is nx to the n minus 1. If I plug in h is 0, that's a constant with respect to h. It doesn't matter what h is. How about all of the other terms? 0. Right? Because all of the other terms have an h in it. And so here it is. This is the reason why the power rule is the derivative of x to the n is nx to the n minus 1. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so then now, strictly speaking, because I use the binomial theorem, a mathematician doesn't typically demonstrate the power rule in this way. The power rule is demonstrated in a completely different way to a mathematician. So for this way, for this way I had to use the fact that n is an integer. So strictly speaking, 
It, the power rule that is demonstrated in the book and here only works for integers. But in fact, I'm telling you that it doesn't, and you're just going to have to trust me on that account. So let's do some examples. So how about, please compute for me the derivative of x to the 42. And then after you do that, please compute the derivative of x to the 1 half. Uh, no, x, the square root of x, I mean, sorry. <laughs> Ruined my joke. And then the derivative of how about 1 over x to the 3. Okay, so for the first one, the first one is a straightforward application, a straightforward application of just the power rule, right? 42x to the 41. And there should be probably little argument about this fact, okay? So then as for this, right, as for this, this is not written as a power. So strictly speaking, it sort of looks like the power rule doesn't apply, but it actually does. Why does the power rule actually apply? Because that is x to the 1 half. And because of my comment to you, yes, I agree that 1 half is not an integer, and therefore it doesn't really, the power rule as we described it doesn't apply, but it actually does apply in real life. So then, what is the derivative of x to the 1 half? Okay, good. So then it's 1 half x to the 1 minus 1 half, uh, excuse me, 1 half minus 1. Okay, now 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half, so then this is 1 half x to the negative one-half, and then after some algebraic simplification, you could finally write this as 1 over 2 the square root of x, like so. I would say that the derivative of the square root of x, memorizing that the derivative of the square root of x is 1 over 2 the square root of x is probably a good idea, because it shows up a lot. So it would be useful for you to just know that as a fact. Of course, one, you know, one, two intermediate steps is not really that far, right? Okay, but nevertheless, it might be useful for you. Okay, so now I'm going to write something that is wrong, but I expect that at least one of you out there did this. That's wrong. But I expect that one of you did that. So have a look at your paper. Don't raise your hand or anything, but have a look at your paper. If you did that, you are in danger of doing this next week. Okay, so wh someone explain to me why this is wrong. That, that is what you were supposed to do. That is what you have to do. <laughs> okay, so for this, this is like, this is like, uh, well, the power rule, the power rule is supposed to work for things like this, right? It's defined for things like so. So I'll just sort of put the ddx operation, I'll just slip it in there in the denominator and ignore the numerator. I, I can't imagine exactly what's happening, but that's, that is nevertheless what happens. So then let's erase that, right? No. So then, in fact, this should be the derivative of x to the negative 3, right? So now it is written in the form for the, for the power rule. So then it is negative 3x to the negative 2, right? Negative 4, right? Negative 4, because if you subtract 1 from negative 3, you get negative 4. Okay, good. So any question about this? Any question? Okay, good. The power rule. Yes? Okay, so then I have no objection whatsoever to you writing it like so. No objection. I also have no requirement. <laughs> okay, other questions? So, in secondary school, there's this concept called simplification. It's not well defined, and in my opinion, not important. Okay, other questions? <coughs> Okay, so we continue. <coughs> okay, so then how about this? So this is called the constant multiple rule. Okay, but really, to a mathematician, this is called homogeneity. Okay, so then that is to say, 
That is to say, what if you have a function g, which is a multiple of another function f? So for example, I can say that g of x is, how about, 5x to the 7. Right, so that would be like 5 multiplied by x to the 7. Now, do you know the derivative of x to the 7? Yes, it's 7x to the 6. But we haven't said anything about what that 5 does. Right, does that 5 mess it all up? And the answer is, it has an effect, but it's not that big of an effect. So let's see exactly what, what the answer is. Okay, so the answer is that the derivative of c f of x is c multiplied by the derivative of f of x. Okay, so that being the case, you should be able to tell me the derivative of g of x now. It would be 35x to the power 6, because that 5 just hangs out there, so it would be 5 multiplied by 7x to the 6. Okay, so 5 multiplied by 7 is 35, etc. Okay, so then let's see why this is the case. The reason why is that the derivative of c f of x is, by definition, the limit <coughs> as h goes to 0 of c f of x plus h minus c f of x all over h. Now, before I do anything else, you should be able to see that there is a common factor. <laughs> okay, that was bad. Okay, that was bad. I agree. But can't, is, is it apparent that you can factor out a c? Yes, okay, good. So then the limit <laughs> as h goes to 0, I ha you know, I've got to entertain myself too, okay? So, <laughs> so c multiplied by c multiplied by f of x plus h minus f of x over h like so, that's an h. Okay, now the term inside of the square parentheses, what is that in the limit? When you compute the limit, what is that? That's the derivative of f, right? That's the definition of the derivative of f. Okay, and what does c do as h goes to 0? It's, it does nothing, right? It stays c. So then this is c multiplied by the derivative of f of x. Okay, but this sort of makes sense, right? You, you, you might have been able to see that this was coming because if you take a line, right, mx plus b, say, and you multiply it by c, then you get cmx plus cb, right, cmx plus cb. So if I give you a line mx plus b, then what is its slope? m. The slope is m. And what if you multiply it by c, then now it's cmx plus cb. So what is the slope of the line cmx plus cb? cm, right, the slope is cm. Okay, so then you should be able to, it should be sort of intuitively obvious to you that if you multiply a function, a function by a constant, then you multiply the slopes of all its tangent lines by the same constant. Okay, good. So any question about this? <coughs> any question? Okay, good. So then let's do a couple examples and then move. <coughs> so for example, that one that was on the previous page, we said it aloud, but now let me do it explicitly. 5x to the 7. So since this is the first time I'm doing it, I want to write it explicitly. So this is equal to 5 multiplied by the derivative of x to the 7. So what has happened here, what has happened here is the 5 sort of came out side of the derivative. You specifically, you know, linguistically, the 5 and the derivative operate are on opposite sides of each other. Right, the 5 came out. So then the fact that multiplication by 5 and application of the derivative operator can be written in either order means that those two operations what? C word. What was it? Commute, right? These two things commute. Doesn't matter which one you do first. You can either 
You can either compute the derivative first and then multiply by that constant, or if you prefer, multiply by the constant first and then compute the derivative. It doesn't matter. At any rate, this is equal to 5 multiplied by 7x to the 6. And then you could say that this is equal to 35x to the 6. I have no objection to you on this on this particular problem just jumping directly to the end. But I wanted to give you these intermediate steps so that you see them at least once. Okay, so any question about this? Okay, so another example. Please compute the derivative of, how about, I don't know, 11 halves x to the, let's say it like this, 11 halves the cube root of x to the 5. Okay, so, and this is only using the rules that we know, right? So then, okay, that's a constant, so it can be factored out, 11 over 2, and then multiplied by the derivative of this thing. Okay, so then, in a sense, I don't have to worry about the 11 over 2, but that cube root of x to the 5, that's a little bit disturbing to me. So then, someone give me an idea of how to proceed. Right, I can say that uh, I can write this expression that involves a radical as a particular fractional exponent. That is to say, I can say that this is x to the 5 to the 1 third, right? Because radical 3 is the same as fractional exponent 1 third. Now I have iterated exponents x to the 5 to the 1 third. So then how is it that you combine iterated exponents? you multiply them, so this is 11 over 2 multiplied by the derivative of x to the 5 over 3. And now this, I can just apply the power rule, right? This is 11 over 2, 5 over 3, x to the 5 over 3 minus 3 over 3, which is 2 over 3. Okay, so any question about this example? Any question? Okay, so then now, <coughs> another thing that we can do, and now you can see that I've gone through the rules, you know, pretty carefully. I gave you the power rule and blah, 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 blah. There's other rules now, and we're just, I'm just going to maybe assign them to you on the take-home quiz, because I don't want to sit here and go through all these rules. Okay, so here's another rule. This is called the sum rule. The sum rule is this the derivative of f of x plus g of x is f prime of x plus g prime of x. That is to say, if I give you two different functions, if I give you two different functions and I ask you to compute their sum and then their derivative, that's the same as computing their derivatives first and then summing them. Okay, so then this will be driven home by just the simple examples. So then how about the derivative of 5x squared plus 10x minus 8? <coughs> so what's the derivative of the first term? Yeah, 10x. What's the derivative of the second term? Ah, this is interesting, right? This is the first time I've asked it. So x, well, that's x to the 1, right? x to the 1. So then you can compute the derivative of x by taking that 1, moving it to the front, and making its power x to the 0. And what is x to the 0? 1. Okay, so then this is plus 10. Now, alternatively, you could view 10x as a line. Okay, so then the, the line 10x has slope what? 10. It has slope 10. So what is the derivative of the line 10x? 10. Good. OK, and then minus 0. OK, so I'm writing minus 0 to indicate, to remind ourselves that the derivative of 8 is 0. Right? The derivative of 8 is 0 because it's a constant. So then how about, how about this one?
Nobody say anything. Okay, so is it is it three pi squared? No, 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 no. It's not three pi squared. Why not? Because pi is a constant. <laughs> Pi is a constant, so the derivative is zero. Just trying to make sure you're paying attention. Okay, so then now, last lecture, last lecture we computed the derivative of x squared plus one, and it took about a page to do so. Okay, so then tell me, what is the derivative? Two x, isn't that beautiful? That's much better than computing the derivative <coughs> using the definition. Okay, so any question about that? Okay, so then that's the sum rule. <coughs> Good. So then the sum rule and the also works for subtraction, right? So then we already saw it work that way. Okay, so any questions before we move on to something interesting now? So here's something of slight interest. So the derivative, the derivative of sine of x. Ah. So, I know I'm aware that some of you have had previous calculus exposure, so then just tell us, what is the derivative of the sine of x? The cosine of x. Ah, but let's see why that's the case. Let's see why that's the case. So, before, before we do anything, we need to know, we're going to have to deal with this expression, the sine of x plus h. Right, we're eventually going to have to deal with that. And in order to deal with this, we're going to need a trig identity. <coughs> okay, so let's see if I can remember what it is. Yes, I remember. So then the trig identity is this. This is called the angle addition formula for sine. So it will be what? Sine of x, si uh, what? Sine of x cosine of h plus sine of h cosine of x. So then that's the angle sum for formula for sine. I hope that is something that you remember. Okay, you should also take the time to remember the angle sum formula for cosine, which is similar but different. Okay. So the derivative of the sine of x is by definition the limit as h goes to zero of the sine of x plus h minus the sine of x divided by h. Okay, that's the definition. So any question about why that's the definition? Okay, so then this in turn is the limit as h goes to zero of, now I will invoke that trig identity the trig identity says that it is the sine of x multiplied by the cosine of h plus the sine of h multiplied by the cosine of x minus the sine of x over h. Okay, so then arguably it's starting to look more bleak. <laughs> it's looking worse now. Okay, yeah, a little bit. Okay, so then now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the terms that I'm circling in red, right, this term, and this term. So you can see that the terms that I'm circling in red, they have a common factor of sine. Right? They have a common factor of sine. So I'm going to take them together and write them over h, and then I'm going to take the other term and write it over h. And then after this algebraic circus of rearranging all these terms, you can obtain, s obtain something that looks like so. So that's an h. So you will obtain something that looks like this. The sine of x multiplied by the cosine of h minus 1 over h, and then plus <coughs> the sine of h over h multiplied by the cosine 
of x. OK, so let's work on these terms to make sure that we agree that I've written them down correctly one by one. So then now, this term right here that I'm circling in green corresponds to this term. Right, so those terms are the same. I just factored out the cosine and wrote, wrote it over to the right. Now the terms that are circled in red right, are these. It corresponds to this one. Because I factored out the common factor of sine, and then you factor out sine and you get this cosine of h minus 1, and then over h. So is there any question about why we are here? Okay, now, <laughs> now, a few weeks ago, or last week, or probably last week, we talked about the derivative of this term in round parentheses. What is the derivative, or n not the derivative, what is the limit of the sine of h divided by h as h goes to 0? It's 1. Okay, and we talked about this term in red, except we had, we, it wasn't cosine of h minus 1, it was 1 minus cosine of h. But it doesn't matter because all that does is multiply by negative 1. And what is the limit of this expression as h goes to 0? It's 0. Okay, so then to make it right, we'll have to multiply it by negative, and instead we'll get 0. <laughs> because 0 times negative 1 is 0. Okay, y'all with me? Okay, good. So then this, this is the sine of x multiplied by 0 plus 1 multiplied by the cosine of x. Okay, so then, all together, right, sine of x times 0, that's 0. 1 times the cosine of x, that's the cosine of x. Okay, so the derivative of sine is cosine. Wonderful. Now, in a very similar argument, but not exactly the same argument, you can determine that the derivative of the cosine of x is what? Negative sine of x. Okay, so then we have these two things. This one that I'm writing right now was the one we just demonstrated. The derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Wonderful. Okay, so any question <coughs> about this? Any question about these things? Okay, so then there's not actually very much interesting things that I can do right now as far as examples. So let me just try and do the bare minimum interest. How about the derivative of 7x cubed plus 8 sine of x minus uh, 4 cosine of x? Please compute the derivative. <coughs> Okay, so what is the derivative of the first term? 21x squared, good. And then plus 8 multiplied by the derivative of sine is, is 8 times cosine, good. And then minus 4 times the derivative of cosine is what? Negative sine of x. Okay, so then now, you can distribute the negatives and obtain that this is 21 x squared plus 8 cosine of x plus 4 sine of x. Okay, so any question about this? <coughs> any question? So incidentally, incidentally, this is just a reminder. I'm sure I already said it. When I say, when I say sine, I always mean S-I-N-E, the trigonometric function. So when I'm talking about the sine of a number, I will always say S-I-G-N. So keep that in, in mind because I don't want you to be confused on that <coughs> pronunciation. Okay, so any questions before we go further? Okay, so I gave for you the derivative of sine, right, using the definition. It required the use of a trig identity. Okay, it required the use of a trig identity. Now, similarly, I think what I'll give for you on the, on the take-home quiz, not now, 
I'll just write down a question. I'm not sure I'll give you exactly this one, but I'll give you one like it. I'll have you compute the derivative of something like, I don't know, the sine of, of 7x. I'll have you do that. Okay, so then how would you do that? No, you can't say chain rule. We have, chain rule is, is an undefined thing. We have no chain rule. You, you have to use the definition, and you have to use that same trig identity. You'll do seven of, but the problem is this, is that you won't, you won't use this trig identity, seven x plus h. You will not use this. There's a large, large percentage of students who will try to use this, <laughs> and they will be wrong. Okay. But you can't use this, right? Because if f of x, if f of x is the sine of 7x, then what is f of x plus h? It is not this. It is, so maybe you're, it's hard to say because parentheses are not pronounced in English. Okay, so then it is this, 7x plus h. So it's 7x plus 7h, right? 7x plus 7h. Okay? <coughs> now, you could use the trig, uh, the angle addition formula for sine, and proceed as normal, almost exactly like the other one on the previous page, and you would determine this. It is equal to the cosine of 7x multiplied by 7, right? So this, I'm just pulling this, as far as, as, far as you're concerned at the, on today's lecture, I have just pulled this out of my hat, and I'm not going to say why this is the case. I'm just telling you that it is. Okay, good. Any questions? Okay, so then now, the next thing we need to talk about is rates of change. So this is largely the motivation for why derivatives are talked about in the first place. Right, so then there was a guy, a really smart guy, some time ago, you might have heard of him. His name was Isaac Newton. Okay, he's the one, one of the people who came up with calculus. Okay, the reason, you know, the apocryphal reason given for him doing that is one day he was sitting under an apple tree and then an apple fell and hit him on the head and imparted all of calculus to him, right? So then, I don't know, right? Now the idea is that, okay, the apple, the apple was falling down. In what way was it falling down? You know, so then in particular, the apple was at first stationary because it was being held by the tree, and then it was no longer being held by the tree, and then it started moving downward. So naturally, it must have been accelerating somehow. Right? And it, its position was translating, so it was moving. So it had a particular rate at which it was changing. And so, so that was the impetus for trying to come up with calculus in the first place. Okay, so then now I have a question for you. What if, what if we all went on a calculus road trip, okay, and we went from Dallas to Houston, and the, the face of Texas was rearranged so that, so that, uh, Dallas and Houston were on a straight line highway between each other exactly 100 miles apart. Okay, so then, if, if we make this trip in uh, two hours, okay, we make this 100 mile trip in two hours, how fast were we traveling? So if we make the 100 mile trip in two hours, how fast were we traveling? Uh, 50 miles an hour. That's a pretty good answer, but I would say, really, the question is wrong. Right? The question is not the right question. Okay, so then the response 50 is because, well, you reason, if we traveled 100 miles in two hours, then, on average, we must have been traveling 50 miles per hour. Ah, but not really, right? Because, because if we did it in two hours, then that's like 
as soon as the wheels start moving, we're pulling out of the driveway. Right? We're not going 50 miles an hour. And then we drive, we drive through the neighborhood for a moment. We're not drive, dr traveling 50 miles an hour. And then we travel on the highway, and then someone says, I have to go to the bathroom. And we pull off, and we stop, and we're traveling zero miles an hour. And then we're, we're, we're losing time, and then we speed up and go faster, and, and we make it in two hours. So on average, we were traveling 50 miles an hour. At any particular instant, we could have been traveling anything almost, anything at all. You know, we're traveling five miles an hour, 15 miles an hour through a, through a school zone. And then we have to travel negative 20 miles an hour because, because John Smith forgot his wallet. And then everything, blah, 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 blah. But on average, 50 miles an hour. Okay, so then that being said, I can just begin to draw the diagram. So if I give you a function, and I will do it like so. Oh, not that one. Okay, so then now I'm gonna I'm going to select select two points on the graph. So if you like to connect it to the previous discussion, I could say that this is time is some value t is a and some other value t is b. So that you might connect this in your brain to, okay, well, we left at 1 o'clock and got there at 3 o'clock. I had a two-hour journey. Okay, so then in between these two lines, in between these two, uh, no, in between these two points, I can draw a line. So when you're not, when you don't have any context, a physical context, when you just take two points on a graph and draw the line in between them, generally speaking, that line is called the secant line, the secant line. So then specifically, I'm going to draw now the secant line. Okay. Or the secant line, okay, something like this. Okay, so then now, I used secant lines in the previous discussion to say, to make a connection to tangent lines. So a secant line is a, a, a line attachment to a graph at two points. But a tangent line is an attachment of a line to a graph at how many points? One point. So conceptually speaking, how is, how is the tangent line associated to the secant line? Yes, that's where you hold one point fixed, maybe the first point at t is a, and then you move the other point, t is b, toward t is a, okay? And then, as long as there are two different points, it's a secant line. But in the limit, we say, okay, we're going to push these points right on top of each other. And in the limit, the resulting object is a tangent line. Okay, now, what's important for you to see is this. Is if we, if we are at uh, pink, I guess pink is good. <coughs> so if here, say we're at you know, mile marker, I'll say D is, uh, I don't know, 50. Maybe we're at mile marker 50. Then when we get to Houston, when we get to Houston, we said that it was 100 miles away, so we must be at mile marker 150. Okay, so then if this was, just to give these names, if this was T is... 1 p.m., and this was t is 3 p.m., then what is the slope of this particular uh, secant line? What is its slope? Well, the slope would be rise over run, right? It would be 150, 50, minus 50, over 3, minus 1, so that would be 100 over 2, and that would be 50. So then, 
if we keep the connection to the Houston trip, this represents 50 miles per hour. So understand what the secant line is when you have a physical context. It is the average rate at whatever you are doing is changing. So you take a trip, you measure it two different points in time, and then you measure the distance that you're at. The average rate at which you are traveling between those two points of, in time is the slope of the secant line between those two points on the graph. So the secant line represents an average rate of change. Average. Okay, so then now, we'll continue the discussion later after this one comment. The secant line represents an average rate of change. So if I shrink a, the time interval from being an interval to an instant, then it's no longer the average rate of change. It is the instantaneous rate of change, also known as the velocity. See you on Friday.